we've talked about phonemes, we've talked about morphemes, what comes next? Rather than talking about the sounds or the meaning of language, we really need to talk about the combinations and syntax. That it's not just that words have meaning, but the order of these words has meaning. Grammar is the idea that if you rearrange words, you can mean something completely different. For instance, the sentence Margot ate donuts for dessert is very different than the donuts ate Margot for dessert. Just by flipping two words around, that can mean something different. And we know that based on where you put your commas and based on where you put all your pauses, it can also change the grammar of something. And so grammar development is something that we start off innately and early on in our lifespan, our grammar is pretty simple because our utterances are pretty simple. Once we get beyond just pronouncing the first syllable of a word and pronouncing the full word, our language is most often hollow phrastic meaning. And this is the idea that we just utter part of a word or one word as a complete sentence. And this relies on a lot of context building. It's the idea that if a young child says milk, you have to know, does that mean they want milk? Does that mean the milk fell over? Does that mean they like milk or they dislike milk? What's going on with milk? And so you need the context in that. So holophrastic meaning is usually one word or just part of one word. And that's a complete sentence, a complete thought alone. It's incomplete grammar to say the least, but it's age appropriate grammar. And once we get around two years of age, we then move on from holophrastic meaning to telegraphic speech. And telegraphic speech is now, we're using more than one word, but we're still using the bare minimum. There's no pronouns, there's no prepositions, there's no conjunctions. And so what's going on here is we might say, want milk. It's not, I would like some milk, please. Or can I have some milk? It's want milk. Play blocks. Not, I like to play blocks. Play blocks. So we're missing some parts of speech. It looks more like a telegraph. It's just the only essential things. Now in the advent of social media, now that we use tweets or emojis to shorten our phrases, we're getting more like telegraphic speech, even in adulthood. But in young childhood, this is typical and normative. But eventually we start to add on those other parts. We start to get the adverbs, we start to get our prepositions, and it starts to make a lot more sense. However, grammar is tricky, and we're going to make a lot of mistakes in learning grammar. One of the big mistakes we make when we're around one, two, or even three years of age is underextension. This is the idea that if a child sees one dog ever and knows that they can call that dog doggy, they might think that's the only doggy in the world, that other dogs would have different labels. If you think back to the last unit in cognitive development, this is the idea that their schema for dogs is super limited at this point, and they're not sure what else can go in that schema. So underextension is pretty typical, but once we get over underextension, we actually do what's sometimes called overextension or overregulation. And this is when we become familiar with the rules of grammar, but we overuse them. So quickly, we learn things about grammatical morphemes. We learn that ed on the end of a verb means that it's past tense. We learn that s on the end of a noun means that it's plural. But in English, there's many exceptions to this. You might learn that you have one cat and two cats. So a child may jump and say, well, one fish, two fishes. One mouse, two mouses, even though we would just say fish and mice. Some really common ones we tend to see with this is one foot, two foots, even though it's feet, or one tooth, two tooths, even though it's teeth. And it becomes really tricky with our verbs, of course. This is the idea that I swimmed yesterday, or I rided, I singed, I bleeded, or I runned, might be common utterances that we hear young children say. Now, you, of course, you can correct them if they're in that zone of proximal development, but sometimes it's not just a matter of correcting them. The brain actually has a neurological limitation on accepting these rules. The, that is that their brain has developed the sense of understanding the rules, but doesn't yet have the neurological capacity to make room for the exceptions. It'll come in time, usually by the time we're four, five, or six, we start to grow and understand these exceptions, and modeling proper grammar can really help them out. Though a lot of parents start using incorrect grammar because that's what their child's been using for the last couple years, which then becomes its own sort of self-fulfilling prophecy back on itself. Another thing we tend to see is kids struggle with pronouns. Struggling with pronouns is pretty typical, and it's the idea that a lot of kids will use he or it or she indiscriminately for everything. It doesn't mean they're trying to misgender things, and it can be really cute, especially if you have a little girl who uses she for everything, including her dad. It's really adorable to say, I love my daddy, she's so nice to me. And it can be really adorable, and it is pretty age appropriate. 
What's really important with this grammar development is this gives kids the confidence to build novel sentences. They're now not just repeating utterances they've heard before and not just repeating short little phrases. They will create their new ideas and they will try and use things that use negatives, for instance, like no and not in sentences. And so building novel sentences is one of the most important, powerful things we can do with grammar. That being said, when we talk about grammar, we really have to emphasize the fact that grammar evolves and language evolves. And a lot of our languages have been around for a long time and the way we speak now is not the way we spoke a hundred years ago or thousands of years ago. When we think about English, it's important to understand that using and enforcing standard English has often been used as a tool of colonialism. And English is used around the world in lots of different ways. We don't all speak the Queen's English. In fact, it's important to recognize that many types of regional English have very, have very profound and elaborate grammatical structures. For instance, African-American vernacular English is its own dialect with its own unique grammar structure that is sometimes improved over standard English. And so different regional dialects may conjugate verbs in a slightly different way. This is the idea that although what's considered appropriate to standard English is began, crept, clung, forecast, and caught, you might have heard the words begin, create, clinged, forecasted, and catched in pop culture or in your home and neighborhood. And that would be just a difference in how you conjugated the verb. And as more people begin to conjugate things differently or speak about them slightly different, then this is how language changes. And language change is not something that only minority groups tend to do. Even people like William Shakespeare, who was celebrated and acknowledged for changing the English lexicon, they tend to do it. So language is not something that exists in a book and will always be as the grammar rules state. Although a lot of us promote the idea of prescriptive grammar. Prescriptive grammar is the type of grammar we tend to enforce in school. It's the type of grammar we tend to enforce when we require people to write an MLA or an APA. And it's the type of grammar where we say, okay, we're all gonna be on the same page and we're all gonna speak the same way. What happens is this doesn't make room for differences and it doesn't acknowledge how language changes. It's making everyone speak in standard English versus allowing those regional fluctuations. So rather we have this idea of descriptive grammar and this is the idea that rather than going around telling people what the rules are and telling people how they need to use grammar in a certain way that's in a book, we instead pay attention and describe the regional variations. This is the idea that linguists may travel around and pay attention to how different regional areas pronounce their vowels a little bit differently or how in some areas we don't pronounce the G on the end of ing words. Instead of working, we might just say working. And so it's the idea that in many different areas, we come up with shortcuts and we come up with ways and to put a little twang on language that is our own. This is why a language like English has so many different variations. Whether we're talking about the Irish twang in Newfoundland or the Cajun twang in New Orleans or an Australian version or an inner city Chicago version. This is still all acceptable forms of language that all have their own unique grammar, dialect, and accent.